going to hand it over to you, Steve, first, just to get the conversation going, and then we'll uh, we'll bring in uh, Bruce and Rudy, and um, hopefully, Zig, you can stick around because I know you've got a lot of expertise in this area, and you might want to contribute as well. But um, over to you, Steve, first. All right, thank you. Let me share my screen. So we have Google Apps Script, and by default, we are in Google Drive, and we can uh, create a new Google Apps Script where it's a standalone. Um, so let's talk about standalones versus contained scripts. So let's move on. So what we're going to go through here in about 15 minutes is we're going to talk about Google Drive folders where we can have like a production or test folder, and then you can have another folder for developers. So in this case, we're talking about what if you're doing a add-on and it's very popular, and now you need a team of developers to help to maintain one or various add-ons. So this is a team environment. Uh, so we're going to talk about what is GitHub briefly, and then we're going to introduce um, a Chrome extension that supplements the existing script editor IDE. And then we'll have a setup GitHub to become master source in that Google Drive. And the point there will be, instead of your source being within Google Drive, we're actually going to use a version control software of GitHub. Then we're going to have each developer push to their GitHub branch, which I'll explain in further detail. Then once that's done, you can merge it with the master. And if there are any conflicts among the developers, it can be reconciled there. And then once that's done, we want to have a separate instance for our production or, or our test uh, version, if you will. So in that case, you open up another copy, another instance of, a, of that Google App script. You want to pull in from the version control software uh, from that master. And then finally, you just do your normal Google Apps script publishing. So let's go through some of this in more detail. So keep it in the cloud by creating folders in Google, Google Drive. So one simple way of doing it, OK, I'm going to have a production folder and a, and a list of developers folders. Now, it is possible to have the developer folders independent via another account, but let's just go with this. So then the developers could be someone like Bruce, Martin, myself, or whomever. Um, so there's this like management of version control. And so we want to have these buckets that are separated is the point here. You could have maybe a production environment. You can maybe have a test folder for QA purposes and then the raw development of the code too. Okay, so what is GitHub? Well, you can see here that we're going to focus on the part of the GitHub of its version control repository. It handles things very nicely. It's widely used. In fact, I think Google themselves use it. So that's what we're going to focus on. And we're going to show you how to uh, interact with the script IDE with this version control software. <clears throat> so the way that is done, someone has written a very nice uh, Chrome extension. It's called Google Apps Script GitHub Assistant. And we can provide the link after our broadcast. And once you click that link, it'll be a quick, uh, easy install. And then what you'll notice is when you open up your Google Script Editor, the IDE, it will now have a supplemental menu options, to, as you can see here, to the right of the select function. It will have a repository, branches, the ability to push or to pull from. So to set this up, we want to, again, focus on the, the main point here of what we're saying. Google Drive is not the hosting, is not hosting the master source copy, but version control is, right? So we have to have that mindset that the the, the main source, the Bible, if you will, is is the GitHub repository. So that's where we trust where all the versions are, and especially our master, OK? So you can use the script IDE to set up a project in GitHub by using the repository and branch, which is interesting. So you don't have to spend all your time in GitHub to setting things up. You have some ability to do it within the script IDE itself. For example, in the screenshots here, you could create a repository by clicking the drop down and click Create the new repo. 
And then once that happens, you have a pop-up. You can enter the name, description, and if you want public or private, and create. And in a similar sense, you can do the same thing with branches. So each developer could create a branch that is designated for them. So that's what can happen there. Okay. Now each developer can push to the designated GitHub branch. All right. So in other words, a developer has their own copy of the latest source. They, then they make edits, and next they need to push the entire code to the GitHub, our version control software. So in this example, I have like Steve version 2 in the screenshot. So once I make my edits to the code, and while other developers are editing their stuff, what I can do is to say, okay, I'm done with my task of maybe adding a function or, or to my code, let's say. So at this point, we want to uh, push my branch up to that version control software of GitHub. Now, I do want to make a point here, as you can see in the last uh, sentence here, that once you've done that task, and then you're assigned another task of that source, uh, let's say you have to add another function. Well, you want to make sure you're in sync with the master. So in that case, you say, OK, I'm going to open up my script. I'm going to assume there's been other uh, merging and things like that with other developers. I want to make sure I get the latest code here. So you can click pull from the master to make sure you have the latest instance of the live production environment, let's say. And now when you make your edits, you, you are confident that you're not going to override anything. Now, once you go through and you push a, uh, let's say you added that function to the source code and you pushed it to your, to your branch, there's now work involved to say, well, I want to sync that with the master copy. And this is where the GitHub uh, version control is very nice, right? You can say, okay, I want to um, compare the master with my particular branch. So you choose your branch. And then you then I'll do a demo of this in just a moment. And then you go through a few clicks and then you're done. Now, if there are any conflicts between your code and another developer, which could happen, right? Uh, you can resolve those conflicts right within the GitHub software. <clears throat> okay. So now let's talk about uh, a publisher. So again, we're talking about a team environment of developers. You can have more than one person playing a role of the publisher, but let's define what, what I mean by that. It's the, it's the person who is responsible to copy or migrate or publish to the live production or even test instances. So yes, you could say each developer, you have to do this, or you could say, no, I want a more control in this situation. Maybe I want to wrap it with a change management process that I may have. I want to have a designated publisher. So it could be an independent person. So for example, here, if Bruce and Martin complete respective code edits and we're merged to the master in GitHub, now it's time to pull the changes into a test or live instance. The publisher, let's say maybe I'm playing that role, would open the Google Apps script within the production folder, which is a separate instance, right? And pulls from the master. And then I would just simply perform the normal publishing process that comes out of the box of Google Apps script. You could publish the add-on or a web app. So before we go into questions, let me do a demo. So here we have my production folder and developers folder. And I'm one of the, the uh, developers, Steve. So let's open up a sample project here. And let's say I want to add a new function as my task. Okay, so I just made a change, so I'll click Save. So now I want to make sure I'm going to the right repository, which project. I want to push it to my developer instance, that branch, and I want to push it up to the GitHub repository. It shows me the differences as a confirmation to say yes, that's what I did. I can enter a comment, click push, then I get a confirmation. Now at this point, let's say each developer is responsible to do 
the merging with the master. So then the developer would open up their GitHub. And this could be private or it could be public. In this case, with GitHub, you can pay a, a service. Uh, I think it's a $7 fee per month to be able to have private um, repositories. So here I have the branch master. I want to do a pull request. And I want to compare with my branch. And then it brings this up. It's able to merge. And I simply click create my pull request. Now, if there's any conflicts with other developers, uh, this is where you can use this software to resolve the conflict. So you can learn more about that on your own, but this remain focus on here. So now we just say merge pull request and confirm. And we are done. So now let's say uh, I'm going to play the role of the publisher, the person who is responsible of getting this update to the, either test or live production environment. So let's say we're doing the live production. So this is a separate instance of the source code, separate from the developers. So in this case, I want to open that. Actually, it looks like I used the wrong sample project. I was supposed to do dev, but we can still continue. So let's pretend I did this correctly the first time. So I open up this. So this is the production one. And now we want to pull from the uh, back from the GitHub into the production one. So we will choose the master. I want to pull that in. But of course, I have done this out of, out of order here, so I apologize. So let's click pool. It says, okay, I'm going to add a new function. I'm going to pull that in. Then it refreshes the screen. And so this is really, really nice because let's say you have dozens of files here. It's going to update all those files that quickly. So now we're, we're just wrapping things up. It's time to go ahead and deploy it as a web add-on and follow the normal publishing procedures or the web app, what have you. So that's basically it. And are there any questions? Looks like a great integration. Awesome. I, I use GitHub a lot myself and um, it's, it's a Chrome extension I'm, I'm very fond of as well. Um, but um, I suppose uh, that leads on nicely, but it, it leads on nicely to, um, I think, what Bruce is going to talk about for the next um, five minutes, um, where one of the nice things about GitHub is it has its own API. Um, so as well as um, as Steve was doing a very, uh, you know, uh, manual process, it, it is also possible to automate the process as, as, as well. Um, so, Bruce, I don't know if you want to, to, to take it from there. I have one question about, one question about the, the Chrome extension. Uh, being a Chrome extension developer myself, uh, I wonder how often it breaks when Google changes their HTML or something. I did take a quick look before the presentation. Actually, I think it was last evening. And the developer of the Chrome extension is very active of making changes and it seems to be being well attended to. So, so far, so good for that. Um, another question from Faustino is um, when you pull um, files from the Git repo, is it going to pull all the files or just um, the files that a, a single it's file? A single that's a good question. It will pull all files. So if if there are 10 developers and you all did different things and you want to update your main production source, you want everything to come over. So it does all files. Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk about automating that bit. I mean, I, I use that same Chrome extension, but I have a slightly different problem in the sense that uh, I have a lot of stuff that I share. And sharing can be quite 
time consuming and, and hard. Um, on my site, I have a thousand pages of tutorial. Um, and that the, the code for that is in 160 different repos. And those, and those repositories use 50 different libraries. So juggling all that stuff manually would be kind of a nightmare. Um, and obviously, if I update a library, I want to make sure that the project that uses that library has got the source code of the library as well as its own source code. So there's no, there's no dependencies that are needed. Um, you know, so you don't download a, a, a project and then find out you need libraries that you don't have and everything. It's all in the same, the same repository. So this is what I'm trying to, to juggle. Uh, so I have something that runs every day and automatically does all that. So we'll just take a quick look at, at that. Um, the, the steps are, first of all, it does an extraction, which takes, which looks at all scripts that I've published, which are in a particular directory, as you can see a, sn a snip of it here. And it takes those, uh, those scripts, those Google Apps scripts, and extracts out from that all the scripts that are within it. So each project will generate multiple files, usually quite, quite a number of files. The next thing it does is to resolve the libraries that are being used by those projects. So if I'm using one of my libraries in a project, it's going to go off and find out what where that is and where its source code is as well. And it's also going to create a doc, an auto documentation of the dependencies for a project, which we'll look at in a minute as well. And then the next step is to take the, you can see this, this, this last column of file names. These are the scripts that have been pulled out of a particular project. And I then want to automatically push that to GitHub for each of the 160 repositories that I've that I've got going at any one time. So that's that's the the steps, and of course that's just one thing, one trigger, one app script trigger that runs every night to do all that. So and the auto documentation, we'll look at the actual one in a minute, but you can see that in GitHub itself, it creates a list of all the dependencies for a particular project, what the project key is, the version, and all that type of stuff. So that's easy to see everything that's being used by a particular project. And it also looks at which advanced services, Google services, I should say, that are being used in that project and, and uh, documents them as well. So that if you happen to want to set up a, a brand new project, you, you've got all the data you need here to be able to do that. So how does it work? Well, um, in my nightly trigger, I've got various settings that say where to look for scripts that are published, where to put them to. And then I've got a few other things that are needed to, to for automation that are not that relevant. But my trigger um, batch program, you can see on the right there, it's three things. It's do the extraction. In other words, pull out all the files from each project, do the libraries, which is to find out which libraries are being used by any project, and then do get, which is to push it up to, to, to GitHub. And down at the bottom, you've got the contribution history of this stuff. So it's 4,800 contributions in the last year that have all been done um, automatically without me even really noticing. So another good thing that it gives me, of course, is I can, since I've got all those files available, I can do some visualization of dependencies and so on. So this is an app script um, uh, app that's looking at what is it? It's an HTML service app using d3.js, and it's looking at all my projects, and it's looking at all the dependencies. So, for example, if I wanted to see, I don't know, um, any one of these things, take that one, I can see that this particular project is using those five libraries. And then I could maybe pick a library, that one. No, it's only using one. Let's get a different one. Um, that one see and I can see all the projects that access that particular library so as a kind of a side product of having done all that stuff in github I can now do all this kind of uh, things to dig into things that are related to each other so let's have a quick look at um, the github repository this is this is the repository for the actual software that we just looked at in fact so it's always got the same format 
um, it's got libraries. These are all the this is all the code for all the libraries that are referenced by this particular project. So this is completely standalone. So you've got it's pulled in the latest versions of all the source code for the libraries it looks at. And the other thing it's got, of course, the scripts is for the project itself. So these are the each one of the projects in the IDE. Um, but very handily, it's got this dependencies file, which it's created automatically as well. And it's so it's going to tell you all the uh, the script files that are in that project. It's going to tell you the references that it it references directly. And if you want to, you can go and have a look at the source code there, what the versions are. Um, and then it's got other dependencies because, of course, those libraries themselves might access other libraries. So it's got those things shown here, and it's got whichever Google services it's using. So that's kind of it. As a, it's really um, maintenance free. I really just don't have to do anything much to this at all. The only thing that happens is that occasionally um, Google change their their dependencies, how the dependencies work. Because the way, if you if you noticed it went off to figure out, I was using, happened to be using the drive advanced service for that. It had to go off and find out which into the inside of uh, Google Apps Script IDE to find out which ones were being referenced. And they changed that from time to time. So that sometimes you need to do a little bit of a hack to figure out how that works when they change it. Um, but aside from that, it's, it's, uh, it's fairly maintenance free. And the final thing is that if you want to, you'll notice that of my three steps, the last one was to push it up to Git, this do Git. Um, if you want to use the Git client itself, as opposed to automatically doing that, then you can just run instead of doing that you can you can do a git push uh, in the normal way that you would do if you had been doing this manually and that's it any questions i i think there is general um uh, wonderment at, at what you've been able to achieve bruce Partic for me um you know you you've been able to visualize your dependencies as well i think is um uh, ticks huge boxes for me, um, but yeah. Uh, but having said that, the, the 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 doing that kind of stuff is really quite easy if you've got the input files that allow you to do it in the first place. Because each um, project starts with a thing I call info.json, which describes the project in mammoth detail, mm -hmm. um, and then you can just use that to to visualize. So I'm not actually looking at it uh, when it does that visualization. It's not really looking at the projects it's looking at the info.json's for every project it, so is there much it, in terms of the info json is that something that you manually have to write yourself or? no no that, that that gets that gets created automatically as well the only thing you need to do is that small setup that i showed you in one of those slides that said where your files are yeah uh, so where your files are and how to log into github and you're done uh, impressive stuff i think it's nice as well to um see the two different approaches here that you know steve was talking about at, you know at managing a, a a team environment where um you're working on code together i suppose with your example bruce it it works because you're the single developer so well actually i use um steve's method as well for when i'm developing um so that i can have test and development and all the rest of it even so typically i'm the only person working on it um, but then once I've got a production version, that goes into my published script. My published script place is the equivalent of production that Steve was showing. Um, and then that's that's what automatically gets replicated to, to those repositories, not the working stuff, if you see. Mm. Okay, this is the presentation I wish I had a year ago. <laughs> a year ago when I got started. Um, if for the, anyone new out there who might be listening, um, I have three key messages for you. One, you can definitely do this. Two, this is a good way to start. And three, check out the link at the end of the presentation. First off, here's a good reading list to get started with, especially item two. It's very deep and it comes from the folks at Zen Hub. And if you went through this and you did some homework, you played around and experimented, you might end up with 
this basic stack for doing your own dev flow. So I'm, I'm looking at doing Google Sheets add-ons. And then again, you'll see some of the same concepts that were mentioned earlier, where you're using GitHub to host the origin or truth repository. You're using GitFlow. So inside of that origin, you have a master and a develop branch that you're always using. And then you're following GitFlow rules for making updates, which means you're creating separate branches and merging them into, into develop and then putting them into master following some conventions that, that have worked for a while. Uh, let's see, ZenHub, basically it integrates natively with GitHub's user interface. It's a layer of planning without the context switching. It's, I think it's very good. So far, so good. Um, the work you do locally, if you're working locally, I like to use Atom. It's a uh, hackable code editor. I think for other reasons, people might want to use Eclipse because it's better integrated. Um, and then Git Kraken, which is a Git GUI. Uh, it's really fabulous. Uh, let's see. Then if you're working in the web editor, um, as we saw earlier, so these presentations are complementary. Um, if, if you're working in the Google script editor, you want to use the, the GAS GitHub Assistant to interact with your remote repository. What does it look like? Let's look at some screenshots. Here's Git Kraken on Mac. You see that the branch history is, uh, first of all, it's visual. Uh, it's uh, oriented vertically with the newest on the top. And uh, on your left, you know, you can see what's local, you can see what's remote, um, and then you can see the tags that have been applied. Um, and then also you see that Git flow, they have a, a, a Git flow layer. Uh, so you can start uh, releases, hot fix, hot fixes or features. Um, let's see, oh, I did wanna mention, um, the cost is very low. Uh, you can you could do it for free if you're using public repos. If you pay a little bit of money, you can have private repos and Git Kraken will let you manage uh, merge conflicts inside of its tool. Here's a Zen board or Zen Hub's task board. I like to call it a Zen board. It's a, they have seven default pipelines that you push your issues through and you can learn all about that. It's sort of uh, post agile scrub approach uh, moving on oh as you can see in the top here you see boards so um zen hub literally is a chrome extension that injects its its functionality inside of github so it's seamless it feels like it's part of github which is a very interesting approach um the next one is this is a look at the atom editor itself um, it can interact directly uh, with your repos, or you can manage all that via Git Kraken, which is what I do. Um, it, uh, this was just talked about. Let me, next slide. Here's a list of practices that you want to employ. Uh, more or less, the overall approach is that you're using Zen Hub task boards or Zen boards instead of GitHub projects. You're using GitHub issues as if they were work tickets or user stories and you're using uh, GitHub milestones um, as your sprints. Uh, let's see here, you want to, key things to make it work, you wanna have a label scheme that goes beyond types. You, you might wanna do some automation um, to standardize some naming conventions, uh, and you wanna implement some templates as well on GitHub. Here's the label scheme I'm using right now. Probably the highlight of it, uh, two things. Um, there's a tool, a link to a tool that allows you to copy labels between repos, very handy. Um, probably the thing I like best about my own label scheme is uh, that there's a set for complexity. So the, the, I associate t-shirt sizes, uh, which is a borrowed idea. And then I put ranges of story points. So story points are ways to estimate that are unitless um, because people are better at comparing um, relative sizes. And then ZenHub has injected in your issue a milestone field for you to actually put what the estimate is. This is how ZenHub runs their backlog of issues through their pipelines. And you'll notice that uh, your product backlog would have, um, once it has enough detail, it floats up to the top in priority and detail. Once it has uh, an estimate, and a milestone and, or excuse me, once it's been assigned to a milestone, you're basically running a sprint. 
somebody working on it pulls it into progress and keeps working. <clears throat> Here's an example of what the semantic versioning would look like. Um, more on that later. Things to watch out for. Well, I would say one thing about semantic versioning. Um, I like to use it in my commit titles because um, it, it's really handy to follow. So not just the major releases where you have like um, x.y.z, right? Um, I go dash the change topic and then dot iteration number. And so that works whether it's a hotfix or a feature. And when I see them in the commits histories, it just sort of orients you. Uh, there's a list of things to watch out for, uh, like merging Zen boards, uh, we didn't, stuff we didn't talk about, um, closing issues, some gotchas, um, a few notes on releases and versioning, uh, which is an important note, basically. You're, well, we'll get into that another time. Uh, what's next? Go to this repo and you'll find uh, the starter templates that are in there, the label scheme that I mentioned. If you star and watch it for ongoing updates, um, what I think I'm gonna do is, is update this DevFlow repo to maybe also do demos or something in the future. And then as I do that, I try to model what the DevFlow looks like. Um, so that's a public repo. And then the slides are up there. There's a, a PDF link. You can download it and all of the links that were listed are live. Uh, seven minutes. Any questions? <laughs> I think it adds another lovely flavor to you know how, how you can approach this and um it's, it's clearly a topic that you've you've um you've spent a lot of time getting to grips with i i wonder if uh, steve bruce you you have any comments yeah um does you know one of the things you'll find with github is that because everyone uses it regardless of which language they're using and everything else like zillions of people use it there's massive amounts of add-ons and tools and everything else that you can use to make your development experience wonderful uh, and you know I, th I think it's if if you're not using github then you really should it's it's quite hard to get started with and but and i would say that if you introduce too many tools at the beginning um before you realize the fundamentals of github you might get a little bit confused so i would say start slowly get to know github and then add some of the wonderful tools that are out there to organize your life as, as Rudy has clearly done. Uh, Rudy, do you want to just respond to Bruce's comment? Yeah, that's fine. I just, um, I would definitely like to to model later like how you, how I'm keeping my semantic version inside the code and then how I'm using that everywhere else. Like in, in analytics, it writes to it, um, how, how I'm managing that and what it looks and feels like because it's, um, I think if people can see it, it's a lot better. So I wanted to sort of, you know, slice the cake all the way. And so I hope this this repo would be a way to um, to evolve exactly, formalize what I think is a workflow for me. Um, and it helps me it helps me move on to more stuff. So I, I appreciate the time. And if anyone takes a look at it, star and follow my first public repo. Thank you. <laughs> we'll be there. Is it, is it I saw you unmuted your video. I, I didn't know you ah, went. Yes, no, you just, so I, I thought it was great. Um, I will look at it in detail and try to start using it um, because it looks very, very helpful. Cool, thanks. And so it's, it's awesome that, that uh, it's integrated into uh, that, that repo. Thanks. And and I would add, um, when I thought of this topic for today, it's one of those things, let's continue the conversation. So there's a lot of people leveraging GitHub with things like AppScript, for example. So please give us feedback and maybe on the next episode, we can share some of those other processes that you have. So thanks. <laughs>